Good afternoon all and thank you for joining us for another Secret Sunday session today. Today I'm joined by Dane and we're going to be talking all about the well-being space as well as getting to know Dane and his story um, being a player in the rugby league community. So to kick us off like always, Dane, do you want to say to everyone who are you and what is it that you're doing with yourself? Yeah, g'day guys. Uh, my name's Dane Weston. Um, I'm currently employed by the Queensland Rugby League as the Wellbeing Operations Manager. So I look after community rugby league, um, look after you know, the wellbeing and critical incidences and anything around that mental health and wellbeing space um, for community rugby league. Amazing. And have you always been involved with rugby league? Yeah, rugby league's been a big part of my life. I, uh, I've played it since I was six years old. Um, I obviously um, played all my life up until 2017. I was quite fortunate to play in the NRL for a number of years and, um, and then go over to the English Super League um, and play there as well. And um, after retiring, um, I worked for the NRL and then went from the NRL to the QRL. So that's all I've known. And... Um, it's something that I'm really proud of and, you know, using my experience as a player um, to then, you know, help others in what I'm doing in this space now. Mm. And going back to those playing days when you were younger, how was that transition from being a young player that loved football to then playing in the big leagues? I had big dreams as a kid. Um, always like this, but my nan um, always said when I was six, I followed the Broncos. And I think at the time they were winning. That's why I was going for them, 92, 93. Um, and I remember saying that I wanted to, you know, play on a roll one day, uh, win a comp and do a lap of, of the um, field with my two boys. And as a six-year-old with a dream, like, oh, it's pretty cool. And um, I was quite fortunate to do that, you know, almost 20 three years later uh, over in the UK with my two boys and um, something, you know, very special moment for me. But when I go right back to being a young kid, that's all I ever focused on. Like, you know, my teachers will tell you that it really hindered my schoolwork a lot of the time, but um, I was just so, when I want to, you know, get something done, I've got that ability just to put everything into it. And um, it's helped me into the workspace too. I feel like there's good traits that I've picked up along the way, but um, it's definitely a roller coaster. Um, I like to say not only my career, but uh, my life in general. I, um, my parents divorced uh, when I was 14, and that was really hard uh, for me at the time. It was really a, a key indicator whether I was going to actually continue with footy or, or you know, follow um, a different path. And I was very fortunate that I was almost forced to continue playing footy, and it's something I really thank you know my mum and dad for. Um, and yeah, from then, 12 months later, I moved out of home. I, I left home as a 15 year old to pursue a dream. And um, again, later in life, psychologists will tell me that, you know, it really affected the way I was brought up. Um, it, it helped me get to where I wanted to, you know, to get to, but, um, you know, things, you know, get sacrificed along the way. And, and my childhood was one of those, um, but they're sacrifices some people make to, to get where they want to be. And, and that was no different for me. And um, I moved to Wollongong and finished school at Dapto High and, um, and had a scholarship with the Dragons. So I was essentially playing with the Steelers at the time in the lower grades. And um, as a 17 year old, I, I left school and, and got signed by the Cronulla Sharks. And um that was a pretty big moment and you know out of school and straight into full-time footy and um and from then I never looked back I, I was fortunate in 2007 to make my debut with the club and Ricky Stewart gave me an opportunity and um and then yeah I was fortunate to leave there and, and went to the Cowboys for a few years um spent 12 months at Burley Bears um kind of a little bit of a setback for 12 months bit of a reality check uh, which we all need sometimes. And then, uh, and then I relaunched my career in the NRL by going to the Panthers, um, you know, and then after that went to the Melbourne Storm. So I, I was very fortunate to play uh, with some, you know, good teams, but also meet some great people. Um, I always say that, like a lot of fans and, and people looking at rugby league just focus on results and, and stuff. But so many good people I've met along the way that have helped shape me to the man I am today and gave me so many lessons to 
to be able to use in my day-to-day -day life and, and also in, in my work, working space. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, definitely a roller coaster. It's not as pretty as, you know, some people make out, but um, definitely wouldn't change a thing. You know, one thing I've always said in my life, I don't regret anything. Um, I wouldn't change anything because, again, they're life lessons and, you know, if we never made a mistake, we'd never learn anything. So, yeah. Well, congratulations. It sounds like you've been everywhere and done a lot and you should be very proud of where you are today going in and transitioning through those clubs and to make mm -hmm. it and pursue your dream. That's amazing. Um, I want to talk about obviously football was such a focus for a really long period of your life and it still is today. Do you think that it's necessary that young kids or people that want to pursue football only have football to focus on? Yeah, it's, it's not healthy, you know, just, and again, going back to my experience, um, hence why I want to change that now in this space is that's all I was focused on. Um, and even if when people were telling me, you know, otherwise that, you know, you might not make it, that used to drive me to, to make sure I did, but um, I made, for me personally, I made a decision when I was at the storm, um, I was in my late twenties to then start looking to study and look at what can I do post footy? And I'm like, uh, the NRL have got so much better with that now where they, you know, when the under twenties come in, they were really making sure that these kids were, had to be either working or studying to play. And I think that's a really good move. Um, things have changed a bit differently with uh, the ages and stuff, but I think it's really important that the NRL and they do um, continually support kids uh, with that, you know, pathway and the development, not only the rugby league, but what they're doing off the field, because as we know, it's a short period of our life. Um, we've got so much more to, to live for after footy's finished. And for some, you know, they get to that stage where they don't make it. And for me, if I look back and I look at the person that was probably, you know, had the same dream as I did, but then got to high school, left and then didn't go on with it. Um, if they had the same mindset as me, then there'd be some really dark, deep, probably uh, traumas there that they're probably still dealing with right now. And it's real. It, it is a real thing. And um, it really, again, I go back to what I'm doing now in this space. It's it's really imperative that the you know new initiative that I'm you know introducing this year is um, it sets people up for you know, resilience, it, it builds that strength in them to go, well, there's other options in, in this world. You know, it's not just rugby league or it's not just sport. It's, there's so many avenues and you can do both, you know? So it's, I don't like to talk about a backup plan. I think it's, um, I don't like that, that word, but you've got to have something under your belt. Like you've got to, you know, go into it going, I'm confident in my ability to do something and I've, I'm going to put my whole heart into it. Uh, but also on top of that, I'm going to build capacity within myself. When I'm done, I can just keep going north. Mm, that's amazing because it is. It I find that even sometimes being within the rugby league community and in the sporting industry, people are so driven and so focused that they don't have an outlook or anything else that does drive them. So when they don't make it or, you know, something goes wrong or you get injured, it's like, well, what's next? Um, yeah. And I want to talk a little bit a lot about that. So when people don't make it and there is a large percentage of people that unfortunately don't make it, um, how are you supposed to support that person or even offer them some sort of guidance or resilience in that space? what are they supposed to be doing well that's the hard one and that that's the one it's like what happens to these people you know and that's why I, I honestly believe that we should be treated like people not based on our ability and that's why um you know I believe in a community rugby league space you know from a young age all the way up to you, you know that time whether you're making the NRL or not um you have you know had a awareness about your mental health you you've got a solid foundation of where you are and um, you can openly you know speak to people about how you're feeling and all these little things that we take for granted but they're so powerful that to see a kid get vulnerable at, at a young age and be confident in within themselves to, to share with people how they're feeling I think that's key for this it's you know by the by the time they get to I always say that you know, if I'm the 16-year-old or the 17-year-old going to the NRL and someone's next to me, the same ability but misses out, 
I continually get looked after by the game. You know, or I continually go on, but that 17 year old, we don't know what happens to that person. And that's the concern for me is even if we build that resilience in that kid from a young age all the way to 17, then if he misses out, his mindset's completely different because yes, he'll be disappointed, but he knows now that, you know, with the resilience and the solid foundation he's built with his own mental health, um, he'll, he's ready for the next stage because he's already built that. But unfortunately, everyone puts their eggs in one basket. They get to that age and it's like, I don't know what to do with my life. Like uh, I don't, it's harder then to get a kid at that age to be vulnerable than it is if they've learned to do that at a young age. And it's like anything, you know, if um, you teach a kid to ride a bike young, it's easier. It's like surfing. I wish I could surf. Mm -hmm. I can't. But it would have been easy for me to practice when I was a kid compared to, you know, how I am now. And it's the same with mental health. It's like, I, I don't understand. It kind of, you know, grinds me a little bit where people tread on eggshells about mental health. It's like this, you know, topic we're not allowed to discuss and you know I come the other way I'm full circle and I, I speak openly and honest about it all the time because I'm like without vulnerability we don't get the brokenness healed we don't get any of that solved it just becomes a, 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 a nice shiny um, you know presentation or delivery or a speech and then on to the next one it's like have we actually made a difference mm -hmm. or are we just doing it because we're being told that's the thing to do and and I'm all about changing it you know it's not one size fits all it's like what can we do in this space that can help everybody and that's that's where my heart is in this it's like it's not just rugby league you know I um through my own you know story as well it's it's created for me to be in a position where I can be that you know that voice and be that um influence that can change it through my own experience and engage with people with that Mm. Looking at mental health and in particular men's mental health, I've seen in the media and I've spoken to people that mental health and introducing psychologists and psychiatrists within the rugby league community is improving and it is changing. But in saying that, do you think players are actually willing to practice it in their everyday life or is it once again people just doing it because they have to? Bit of both. I think we can't put everyone under the same umbrella, but um, at the same time, some are better than others. Um, but it's, unfortunately, you know, I come back to it all the time. We, if we're talking about the NRL stars, there's so much money in the NRL at the moment. Like it's, and I, I don't agree with a lot of it. I think the players are getting paid way too much money. Um, and effectively, it causes a lot of their mental health or ill health because at the end of the day, they're, they're always competing. You know, there's always a contest. It's like, well, if this person can buy this, so can I, because I've got the money. And they build this, you know, value in buying things and having things. And then all of a sudden, it's like when that feeling runs out, it's like when you buy something new for the first time, it's like that, you know, rush of, you know, you're like, how good's this? But then after it, you're like, oh, that feeling's gone. Um, and, and that's, for me, there's a lot of that where people are like, oh, I've got issues. I was one of them. Like, I literally was told that, you know, I was depressed. Like, I was 24 years of age. Um, I was, you know, at the top of my game at Penrith. I was getting paid a lot of money to do what I did. I was married. I had two kids. I was like, what have I got, you know, to be depressed about? And that's the mentality I had. I literally was like, no, nah, I can't, I can't admit or I can't say to people I've got issues because, have a look at my life but it's actually it's something we can't control that like that's all on the surface and that's uh, but that's not that's not right either it's like we should, no matter what our value is in our bank account how we are as a player or what when we recognize that we've got issues that's the most important thing you know money can't solve it you know money can't buy you happiness that can't buy you love mm. um and I, I feel that the people that probably push that aside either don't believe in it that it's that serious or by going and getting these tangible things to make them feel better um, is where it's at. But in saying that, I've seen so many people on the other side of things where they do get the help and they feel so much better. And everyone's different too. And that's the thing. Some people find, and I did as well at times, I found uh, meeting people and I feel like I've met people along my 
journey, uh, you know, not by accident. Um, there's no coincidence I've met certain people in my life and um, I believe they'll put in my life for a reason and I've learned so much of people that um, shared similar, you know, setbacks in their life and, and you know, especially with mental health and, um, and that's helped me. Um, I've gone through plenty of psychologists um, and sometimes they just don't work, you know, um, for, you know, until you find the right one. And I think that's where people make a mistake. They'll see one and then they don't feel like they're engaged with this. And then they're like, oh, it's not for me, instead of going again and finding the right person for you, mm. whatever that, you know, um, looks like. Mm. And looking at your journey and when you said that you did go through a period where you were experiencing depression and you saw yourself as having this amazing life and a lot of people do and that's where they don't go and get help because they're like I'm just being ungrateful but when you look at your period in your journey through your depression why do you think you went through that um looking back now like uh, there was two parts to this I at 24 I ignored it so I went through a time where I was really moody. I, I never understood why. Um, again, coming back to how good my life was at the time, I kind of ignored it. Well, I didn't kind of, I did ignore it. And it wasn't until I was in the UK, almost six years later, these feelings started coming back again. They were a lot deeper than they were at Penrith. Um, again, I was at the top of my game. I was, I was playing really good footy. I'd gone to the England. I was getting paid. Same scenario, getting paid good money to do what I love over the other side of the country and getting to travel the world. Like it was just next level. And um, again, I used to get in these moods and I'd go to foot. Footy was an outlet for me. So that was my medicine at the time, so to speak. And I'd go to training, I'd do the training, I'd play and I'd be fine. But as soon as I left, it was like I come down off a, off a drug. Like, and then I was like, and it was, I was trying to use rugby league as my fix. It was like, well, I'll get there to train and then I'll feel better, but I'd leave and I wouldn't. Um, and that's when I've seen someone again. And it was literally my ex-wife was the one that said to me, you need to go see someone or, you know, pretty much put it to us. And, um, and so I did, and she come along and um, I knew what the doctors were going to say. Um, so I knew already what they were going to say and I knew what was wrong with me. And that's when I owned up to it. And I was like, well, I'm going to try and, you know, do something about this. And unfortunately, I tried to do everything myself. Um, and I look back now, I, I got real, you know, to a point where I used to think about not being here every day. Like it was literally the first thing I'd think about every time I woke up. Um, it used to last until I'd get the training and then the feelings would come back in the afternoon. And, and I wore a really good mask, you know, like I, I wore one better than, you know, some, and no one knew this whole time, no one knew what was happening in my life. And um, my ex-wife had an awful time with me. And, um, and at the same time, I was, I was never angry. I was never, I was just literally like numb, like a lot of the time. And I was just like, I, was that mentally exhausted? I was like, I'm done. I'm, I just don't want to be here anymore. And um, it got that bad um, that I used to think about how things were going to play out, you know, if I wasn't to be here. And and for a man who's, you know, so caught up with structure and I plan everything out and even to that, and as crazy as it sounds, that's just how it was and that's my personality. And um, I ended up, my wife left and um, we're in the UK at the time, two kids and uh, she moved back to the Gold Coast and kind of rattled me because my ego probably drove a lot of my career, my life where I thought, well, I earn money, you know, I've got a great wife, kids and, you know, I'm pretty, you know, unbreakable and um, this this point, everything come crashing at once. So I, I ended up pretty much having to scramble and pack up me, um, you know, life over in the UK and, um, and, and move back to the Gold Coast to, to try and you know, salvage my marriage and um, and whatnot and retire all at once. So it was a it was one of them where I had to retire instantly. Um, you know, I was dealing with what I was mentally, and then to try and salvage my marriage was was the toughest thing I've ever been able to do. And um, that wasn't something I was able to salvage. And um, yeah, and I was in a dark place for a good 12 months past that. Um, 
drugs, alcohol, as you could imagine, was something that I used to abuse myself. And again, that was my, you know, fix. And again, it was such a toxic lifestyle I was leading. And um, yeah, pretty much got to that, you know, the day where um, I attempted to take my own life. And um, it's easier to talk about now because like you just asked me before is why I believe I went through that, all that. I believe through my newfound faith uh, with Christ is I went all through that so I can now help other people. And I honestly believe that um, we all fall short and, you know, in our um, godly way to sin is fallen short of, of you know, God's, God's way. And, um, and I sinned all my life. I was, you know, um, doing things that, you know, isn't, wasn't something I was proud of. And when I got to a point where um, I humbled myself to know, well, there's something greater than me in this, in this, you know, life. And um, I found Christ and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And um, I now know through my journey that this is my purpose. It's my purpose to help others not feel the way I do. Uh, but if they do, um, use my experience to to help them through that and show them that there is more to life. Um, so yeah. Oh, what a phenomenal journey, and I'm so sorry that you had to go through all of that. But each day when you say that you were having those thoughts of, you know, not wanting to be here and going through the drugs and going through the alcohol, what kept you going each day? Was there something each day that just kept you continuing just to wake up? Uh, my two boys, obviously, you know, like um, they were something that, you know, obviously drive me. I never wanted to let them down. Um, you know, I, I beat myself up for so long um, because I never wanted them to be in a position I was as a kid with, you know, parents being divorced and, um, and you know, I dealt with being a failure for so long. You know, when people retire from a game they love that you hear of so many NRL players I know plenty of you know mates of mine have gone through the same it's hard enough leaving a game but to then leave uh being the circumstance I was in it was it was something that I beat myself up about every day about being a failure and I was so hard on myself I still am to this day I'm you know I in different ways but um my kids obviously were the driving point to continually you know do what it took to get through and some days I couldn't see it some days I, you know it was a blur some days I couldn't tell you what happened in them days because I was just about getting through each day and I used to spend a lot of time in in my room I used to spend a lot of time um, not wanting to see people um, social anxiety was a huge thing for me I just wanted to stay inside the think the thought of going to see people and try and make conversation is something I was ashamed of because of knowing what I'd gone through and and stuff so it was just about getting getting through and, and to be honest other than my my boys you know that attempt probably would have happened a long time ago so it's you know they're they're two that I owe my life to you know they're the ones that I, I do all this for as well you know and um and you know for where I am now I'm, I'm now married and I've got a beautiful wife who um you know helped lead me to Christ and and she's such a strong woman and um I wouldn't be where I am right now without her as well do you see still see yourself as a failure today no I don't um I you know I'm, I'm so that's why I love talking about it because um you know again through you know my forgiveness and surrendering my life to Christ and you know I, I can't speak highly enough about it. it it's something that um has breathed new life into me um you know, it makes me see life so much different to know that I'm literally doing God's work in what I do every day to help our community. It's help getting people out of that brokenness and, and understanding that you can feel as broken as you want, but there's always a new day to wake up to know that today's the day that you change. Today's the day you're forgiven for all that. Like, um, and I think it's a big thing and through my Christianity as well, it's forgiving yourself um that was one thing I struggled with for a long time because I was like well I've done this to so many people um I got to a point where um you know forgave myself for what I how I treated my ex-wife and uh the pain that she you know went through and probably continually goes through now um is something that I feel for her um 
And during our separation, it was just anger. It was just pointing the finger. It was all her fault. It was, you know, there was so much blame that, you know, usually people do because it's it's their fault. But you, you, you want to say it's other people's, you want to deflect. And that's all I was doing. I was blaming everyone else but myself. But the day I owned up to all that and understood that, no, I own this. This is all my, you know, responsibility. Um, doors open. My life is just honestly, you know, from the moments and the decisions and, and again, following Christ, it's, you know, life you know, it can't be better at the moment, you know, and I'm still facing adversity to this day. There's still things that happen. And the funny thing people think, you know, like, you know, you've got a relationship with God and, and stuff that, you know, everything should be just great in your life. Well, no, it's the same thing. There's going to be lessons, you know, throughout our entire life that are there for a reason, builds character, resilience, and, um, and I'm a firm believer in it all, but yeah. Amazing. And with the position you're in now with the QRL, what is your mission and goals? Yeah, so in a nutshell, I, uh, I started this job in May last year and um, my whole goal was to just to get a mental health first aid person at every community regularly club in Queensland. And um, with a few discussions with the QRL and a few people, um, we decided to go with the concept called support squad. So implementing not only um, a qualified mental health person at each club, but actually identifying as a wellbeing support at each club by having a colour, um, aligning that with the sports trainers and the league safes and the first aid officers at each club. Um, they've been given a colour and everyone recognises that colour. So we went with the bright purple and um, we, well, we just believe that, and I do personally, is why I wanted this to begin, is that we share so much importance around injury, surface things again. It's like we we hurt our knee, we know who to go to, and we've got someone there to fix it. But why is it so important to do that and put a mandatory position in place for every community rugby league club in Australia, but we don't have a mandatory wellbeing person at community rugby league level? And that's something I want to change. And that's, that's why I've started this support squad in Queensland. Um, very grateful for QRL to provide me funds to be able to do this at a, a minimal cost for the volunteers and the clubs. Um, but ideally, I get back to what I was talking about earlier today, which is this spark this and where my heart's in this. Um, I look at a kid starting, you know, at a community rugby league level when I did at six. If you've got a support person at community rugby league level that is identified and kids know that if they're struggling, they've got someone to go to. If things happen, you've got a wellbeing person there to report and then, you know, essentially pass that report on to us, you know, higher up. But um, at the end of the day, I just a firm believer from six to 16, that's when your mental health, you know, foundation's built whether it's a positive one, negative one, um, whatever that looks like, that's when it's key to get into these people um, and these young kids and treat them like people. Forget the rugby league concept, but we can leverage off having so many people um, at, a, at a sporting um, you know, organisation to be able to utilise. And I feel like it's our duty of care to, to look after them, not just you know, the footy side of things or the sports side, but prepare them to be better people. So when they leave our game, um, and we talked earlier about that 16, 17 year old, they're in a better place and they feel like they're in a better position, you know, if they have challenges in life. So um, currently it's just a, a Queensland thing, but, um, you know, in discussions to potentially grow this, you know, across Australia and, you um, had a lot of good conversations and, and um, support from other sporting franchises as well. So, um, yeah, it's only positive, uh, the future of this. Amazing. I think it's incredible to have that in the sporting industry in general. It would be amazing to have it Australia-wide and even worldwide. Mm. Um, as you said, just to have that person there to to know that you can go to them and know that they're going to listen or they're going to care for you or support you because at the moment we just don't have that and it would be amazing to have yeah. Um, is there any last advice or tips that you would like to offer to any players out there, anyone that may be experiencing depression or depressive thoughts? What advice and what lessons have you learned that you could share? Um, I think I touched on it earlier. It's just 
speak up. I think um, don't put off something you can do today um, as well. And um, I suppose don't be like me. You know, I, I put off things for years. And um, But I think being vulnerable, being able to be safe, um, be close to people that you trust and, and open up to them. And um, you get power with sharing. I, I know this and I've seen it from young kids and I see it with adults as well that as soon as they share, something that just feels like a weight off their shoulder straight away. Um, so my advice has always been that, you know, if you've got an issue, something's happening, don't feel like it's too small or too big for anyone else to handle. Go and see that friend, that person, whoever it may be initially and share it. Amazing. Great, great advice, especially in the world that we're living in today. Um, thank you so much for joining me today on our Secret Sunday session. And thank you, everyone else out there as well. I want to say a big thank you again to you, Dane, just for sharing your story and doing everything that you're doing with the QRL and in the Rugby League community. It is phenomenal. We need more of it. Um, and hopefully we can watch the support squad uh, take over Australia and the Rugby League community, which would be amazing. But thank you. Um, and as I said, thank you, everyone else out there for joining us for another Secret Sunday session. I was speaking with Dane today and I will put up all the links where you can check him out. Otherwise, I will catch you guys all next time. See you later.